In the previous programs, based on interviews with pilots, photos and videos, radio confirmation, traces on the ground and official government declarations, amongst whom are the ex-Soviet Union and the USA, we have concluded that the UFOs understood to be unidentified objects guided by someone extraterrestrial exist. But who are those pilots? There isn't an official reply. Obviously, some people who say that they've had contact with them have spoken about them. Some of the extraterrestrials would be benevolent, worried about our future. Others would take organic substances from kidnapped terrestrials, a worrying fact. But is the UFO phenomenon new? Not according to numerous experts. The Vedic, Sumerian, Egyptian, Maya, and Aztec texts would talk diffusely about visitors from the stars. And even the circles in the cornfields, revealed in many countries over the last few years, would connect the ancient traditions with messages from faraway civilizations in space. The UFO subject matter is covered by state secrets. What can be hidden behind the curtain of official science? And why the secret? It is the theme of this last program. We are entering a hypothetical field, certainly, but with many pertinent questions. We base ourselves, above all, on American materials. What is hidden behind the top secret? Let's start with the official documents. In 1947, General Twining prepared this document for the Pentagon, in which he says that the UF phenomenon is real that the objects have the capacity for extraordinary flights, that they're metal, and that they carry out elusive maneuvers, which makes one think of an intelligent guide. Their technology and origins are unknown. This document has been recognized thanks to President Carter in the 1980s. The main question is, is the USA in possession of a fallen UFO? The answer is yes. On the basis of this document, written in 1947, by Edgar Hoover, then chief of the FBI, you can read, the FBI must have access to recovered UFOs. Another question is, has the USA recovered alien bodies? On this 1950 memo from an FBI agent to his boss, Hoover, you can read that the military aviation is in possession of three small humanoids. This was confirmed in 1983 by Professor Sarbacher, a real witness. He writes, The material of construction of the UFO was light and resistant. The humanoids had internal organs similar to insects. Suddenly, that is, in 1947, they started to cover up operations. The effective study continued through a secret group called the Majestic 12. In this document, handed over by an anonymous person, you can read about a UFO which fell from the sky at Roswell with dead aliens on board but everything has always been officially denied. However, in this 1950 document, the Canadian engineer Smith tells his government that in the USA, a secret group led by a professor of Bush has been assigned to study UFOs. That is Majestic 12. We are traveling in the direction of Roswell, New Mexico, where in the distant past of 1947, flying saucers would have fallen and alien bodies recovered. It seems like a science fiction film. Here, something unique would have happened. Something absolutely extraordinary. We've tried to reconstruct the facts. July 1947. The Roswell Daily Record prints the official news that the military aviation personnel have found the remains of a flying saucer. The scoop went all the way around the world. A UFO has fallen from the sky, not far from the Roswell military base. The remains of the UFO, found by the farmer Brazil, have been handed over to the military base. But the next day, General Ramey, in a press conference, declared that those remains were simply those of a sounding balloon. press published the official denial. This is Roswell, a quiet rural town, small houses, 
well-kept gardens, ordinary streets. The military academy verifies the importance of Roswell for the US Army. In the 1940s and 50s, Roswell was the base for the atomic bombers who dropped the bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima in Japan. What happened near Roswell? Was it a sounding balloon or a UFO? No, it certainly was not a mogul balloon that was picked up in Roswell in 1947. I've been investigating flying saucers since 1958, and I was the original investigator on the Roswell story starting in 1978. I've talked to many dozens of people who were involved in one way or another. I was the first to talk to uh, Major Marcel. Major Jesse Marcel. At a radio station, a journalist said to Friedman, The man you ought to talk to is Jesse Marcel. I say, who's he? <laughs> and I didn't know. He says, well, he handled pieces of one of those saucers you're interested in when he was in the military. That got my attention, as you can imagine. And I called Jesse the next day. The reporter showed up. He was listed in the phone book. I talked to him. He told me the story. Jesse Marcel spoke about it bravely. It was a very dangerous subject. The military people in particular were very strongly intimidated by the government. Some of the community people were as well. The sheriff's granddaughter talks about her grandmother telling her, that the military told him, if you ever talk about what you saw, we will kill you and we will kill your family. And the granddaughter's horrified to hear this. Did you believe them? And the grandmother quietly said, I was there. Yes, I believe them. Friedman has found 200 other witnesses besides. This is the center of Roswell. Some veterans of the old military base have created a small museum to record the extraordinary episode of 1947. Walter Hout was then the chief press officer of the base. Uh, the only thing wrong with that whole story, in talking with Major Marcel, he made the statement to me on several occasions that the material that I took into General Ramey's office is not what uh, was shown to the press. It was That was a weather balloon that he had there. That's not what he t had taken into the office. And there was not much I could do. The general said, you're going to say that that is what you picked up and brought in to me. And he said, it wasn't different material. He felt that it was something extraterrestrial. Materials that were a little bit different than anything we have or had in our possession at that time. Uh, what we now have is aluminum foil. It was about that uh, consistency. It was a shiny silver metal that it, you crumbled it up in your hand, and when you released it, it would go back to its original form. After the farmer, Mark Bazell, gave the UFO remains to the base, Major Jesse Marcel inspected the places. He gathered himself pieces of strange material, went home and showed them to his wife and son, who were then 12, and he remembers. And there's a lot of pieces of metal, and it uh, looked like black, plastic, sort of like Bakelite. Uh, there was a lot of foil-like material, like uh, aluminum foil, except it wasn't quite aluminum, at least it certainly didn't look like that to me. It was not highly reflective, but it was just uh, pieces of what looked like uh, aluminum foil, kind of a dull aluminum color. And then there were pieces of I-beam materials that had uh, uh, writing or symbols. The symbols that I saw looked like uh, geometric forms, like uh, uh, circles, uh, triangles, squares, uh, various different geometric shapes. And uh, years later, I talked to my dad about this to see if his recollection was about the same, uh, which it was. We compared notes as to the color, the size, and the general appearance of the symbols. The uh, character of the debris, certainly the symbols that were written across this I-beam, uh, did not look like it was 
uh, something that came from our own civilization. He was always very certain about that. He, uh, he uh, never had any doubts in his mind where this uh, came from or where it didn't come from. It did not come from planet Earth, but it came from someplace else. We examined this material for about 15 or 20 minutes in our house there in Roswell. I helped him put it back in the box and load it back in the car. And then he flew back, he flew the material to car, to uh, Fort Worth Air Base at Carswell. And uh, when he came back the next day or maybe the day later, I'm not sure exactly the timing here, he told us to, my mother and myself, don't talk about this. This is a non-event. Didn't happen. Don't even talk about this with your uh, friends, which I did not. The recovered material was taken from Roswell to the military base at Fort Worth and handed over to General Ramey, who declared that it was the remains of a sounding balloon. Airman Shirky helped transport it. I saw Major Marcel go by and four or five of the fellows were carrying open boxes, cardboard boxes, with scraps of metal stacked up in them. Major Marcel had carrying a box that had the uh, I-beam sticking up in one corner. So I just saw the material. And uh, <clears throat> I knew we sent that aircraft off to Fort Worth. But were extraterrestrial bodies of pilots recovered? Frank Kaufman of Swiss origin was then in the Secret Service and stationed at Roswell. He is the only living witness to declare not only to have cleared the area of UFO remains, but also to have recovered three of the five alien bodies who died in the crash. He won't appear on TV, but he allows us to tell his story. The extraterrestrials are about one meter 40 tall. They have big eyes, a small nose, and their skin was reddy brown. They seem very human-like. He tells that one of them had eyes looking up to the sky with a sweet and intelligent expression. The UFO, says Kaufman, possibly crashed because of radar interference. Every trace of the incident has been wiped out when, between 1947 and 48, the military aviation was disassociated from the army. Everything is secret, but now that so much time has passed, he feels the need to talk about it. The extraterrestrials had come down, Kaufman tells us, to see what humankind was doing with the atomic bomb. He says that the Earth is still in danger of nuclear collapse. At that time, Glenn Dennis, who was employed as an undertaker, was asked by the base to provide coffins and ice for children. At the base, Dennis saw the remains of the UFO and met a nurse, an acquaintance of his, at the door of the local doctor's surgery. She said, uh, uh, you're in, get out of here, get out of here as fast as you can because you're in a lot of trouble. You will be in a lot of trouble. But in the, then she went on across, and in the meantime, she was having difficult breathing. Next morning, about 11 o'clock, she calls me and uh, said she had to talk to me. She said, we have to get together. Uh, she uh, informed me that and this lady was still crying. She was she was still upset, and her face was all uh, scratched, and her hair was messed up, and everything. That she said she hadn't slept all night, and she was you know she didn't know what was going to happen. She said that in one crash bag there was two very mutilated small bodies, and she explained that they had a, the hands were severed on one. The doctor would take a long forcep and turn it over. They explained that there was four fingers, very fragile. They had little pads on each end of the four fingers. And uh, the way the doctors described it, that it looked like there might be little minute suction cups in those pads. 
Uh, she explained to me that they had a the very large head that were flexible like a newborn child. The eyes were very large. They did not have a bridge. The nose, of the face was concave. They had two orifices. The mouth was only one inch. There was no teeth or tongue. They uh, did not have the ears, as we know. They had two ear canals, a double ear canal, not just one ear canal. Uh, so uh, what she did, the night before, she drew me a, a small diagram on the back of a prescription pad that she always kept in her uniform there. And she did the best she could on on, on the drawing of, of the head and the, the little arms and explaining to me what it was. She gave it to me and told me that... Uh, uh, she wanted me to have it, but that I would never reveal where I got it. I mean, that her name. She did not want to be involved anymore in this, and all. And I gave her a sacred oath that I would not reveal her name. And uh, that was the last time I saw her. I called out the next day, and they said that she was transferred out that afternoon. They don't know where. About six weeks later, I get a, a letter from uh, England about six weeks later my letter came back and down on the corner it said return to center and it had in the red letters deceased and it was sent back to me following the roswell controversy at the beginning of 1994 the republican representative of new mexico officially asked for explanations from washington in september 1994 the reply was given with this document which confirmed the theory of the sounding balloon specifying that it had been used to reveal eventual atomic explosions in the ex-Soviet Union. But the document was full of gaps. Besides, all the documents from that distant summer in 1947 have disappeared. Is this just one instance? And this is one of the so many official documents on UFOs released on the basis of the freedom of information law brought in by President Carter in the 80s. Censorship, as you can see, has had a heavy hand. What do they want to hide? It's certain this is biased information, full of gaps, lends itself towards disinformation, speculation. And so the UFO which fell to Earth at Roswell may be one example of many such incidents, most of which have never been officially acknowledged. And this photo of an alien taken in Hong Kong and circulated as true is that of a dummy that even we filmed at the Roswell Museum. And recently the news of the filming of an autopsy of an alien has gone round the world, taken in 1947 by a military operator. It is the film Santilli, taken from the name of its discoverer. A controversy arose from time to time over this theme and which has become also very bitter. But is there proof for or against the authenticity of the material. Michael Hessman, a well-known expert, has researched this theme. And um, so I started a very careful investigation, and today I can say that um, we discovered a lot of indications that the film very well might be the real thing, but we did not find any indication or any evidence of a fake of a hoax yet. In the film sequence, you would see even President Truman next to the remains of the UFO and the alien bodies. Obviously a state secret. If he has the uh, footage of President Truman, then I believe that would be dangerous for him. And I believe that's what's happened. I believe somebody has said, yes, by all means, go ahead with what you've got. But if you show President Truman on film, you're going to be planted in the desert. <laughs> but this is just your feeling, or...? Uh... My, my... It's a little bit more than a feeling, but um, there's something going down. Uh, he was visited by two um, agents at one time, and uh, I believe at that meeting something was said, and then it, it changed everything. It was President Truman himself who created the secret Majestic 12, on which we've already talked about, who prepared the document in which you can read in detail the facts about Roswell. Another document, still by Majestic 12, 
explains how to recover and deal with extraterrestrials. The title is Extraterrestrial Entities and Technology Recovery and Disposal. It says Restricted SOM 1-01 Classification, Majestic 12 Group, Special Operations Manual. And in this paper, the government in the United States referred to them as Extraterrestrial Biological Entities. And then the acronym was EBES. The document describes in minute detail the two types of alien known in 1954. The first type is humanoid, similar to an oriental person. He is 1 meter 60 tall, weighs 50 to 60 kilograms, has a big round head, no hair, pale skin, which is yellowish and thick, small wide oriental eyes, subtle nose, wide mouth, and strong and muscular physique. The second type is more humanoid, 1 meter 20 tall, 30 kilograms in weight, very big black eyes without eyelashes, no nostrils, two nasal apertures, small mouths, pale blue gray skin. They have no breasts. They have four fingers joined by a membrane. The Majestic 12 documents come from an anonymous source. Are they authentic? I've been working on that for 10 years, the Majestic 12 documents. I've been to 15 archives, I worked under security for 14 years, so I've handled thousands of classified documents, wrote some myself. My conclusion is that the briefing document for President Eisenhower dated 18 November 1952, the Truman Forrestal Memo of uh, September 24th, 1947, the Cutler Twining Memo of 1954, and some of these later editions that people haven't seen. I'm convinced that these are genuine. And I think that if any major newspaper, New York Times, Washington Post, London Times, whatever, were to spend the same amount of effort as the Washington Post did on blowing the top off the political Watergate, working on the cosmic Watergate, starting with the MJ-12 documents, starting with people like me who've spent a lot of time, I think they would succeed. Having them have the will to do it is another story. But the MJ-12 documents, certain of them, are genuine. And there are documents which show the existence of a special group, Blue Fly, which was set up for the recovery of fallen UFOs. It seems like it intervened in Mexico, South Africa, Australia, and elsewhere. What number would they got up to today? 68 fallen UFOs? In the 1960s, Sergeant Major Robert Dean was part of the General Staff of NATO. Under the command of General Lemnitza, shown here in a photo dedicated to Dean. NATO often entered into maximum alert because of unknown squadrons, that is UFOs, coming from the communist bloc, had flown over Western Europe, disappearing over Scandinavia. Dean was able to read a fat secret file of NATO on the theme. What were these squadrons? Was it a danger to NATO? They also determined, and this was the primary reason for the study, they determined that there was no military threat involved because the completely, repeatedly demonstrated level of technology that they had was so far beyond anything we had that if they were malevolent or hostile, it would have been over a long time ago. We and the Soviets, both of us knew that the UFOs were real. And both sides thought that if we could ever get a handle, get a, get a hold of the propulsion system, the, the visitors were uh, using 
extremely sophisticated anti-gravity electromagnetic propulsion. When I left the military, we knew of four different groups. And out of those four, one group looked exactly like we do. I mean exactly. So much so that they could sit next to you in an airplane or a restaurant or in a theater, and you would never know. I do believe that at least some of the groups, I have to bear in mind there are different groups with different agendas, but some of them apparently do very deeply care that the human species survives and that they have been trying to assist, they've been trying to help us, they have recognized that we have reached this incredibly delicate level of high technology. And I believe that our visitors, our family, are trying to assist us as you would a younger brother or a son to make that transition, to grow up and mature. Some level in my government, someone wants me to continue to do what I'm doing. Because I continually share what I know with people in a non-frightening, in a non-threatening way. And I do it leaving them with a sense of hope. And I think that my government probably wants me to continue to do that because I'm, I'm a realist. I'm an old retired soldier. And that if my government wanted to close me down or shut me up, they could have done it so easily over the years. But have you met any visitors? And I will not amuse myself with you. I must tell you in all honesty, the answer to your question is yes. But I am not at this moment prepared to go into great detail. But yes, for some time. And I consider them my friends. Do you think that the U.S. government has had contact with the visitors? I have a lot of good friends who are in sensitive positions in government. Many of them my age who are still with government. Most of my old friends have retired now. But some still work at Langley, at Fort Meade, in different parts of the government. And they say that uh, the evidence is pretty clear that we do have and we have had for some years some kind of close interrelationship with at least one and possibly two different groups from out there. And the evidence that I have seen is evidence that I trust and I, I tend to believe it. I tend to accept that. I've had too many sources from different directions that have provided me information which uh, I've accepted. It's pretty real. We have news that President Eisenhower in 1954 had a meeting with extraterrestrial visitors in the military base of Edward, not far from Los Angeles. He, the president, mentioned it in this letter in 1954. The CBS journalist, Gerald Light, was present at the episode in a private capacity. He writes, A group of UFOs came down to the base and showed extraordinary capacity to fly, appearing and disappearing in front of dozens of confused scientists. The fact was confirmed in 1982 by an experimental pilot who accompanied Eisenhower on that extraordinary occasion. The extraterrestrials were speaking English and suggested the president publicize their presence through an information program. Eisenhower said he wasn't ready. These things are highly improbable without any clear evidence. They took place far from prying eyes, inside military bases, in desolate areas like this. In the 1980s, the American UFO expert, William Moore, came into contact with a secret agent, Falcon, a pseudonym. 
who allowed him to photograph documents from the Aquarius project prepared in 1977 to brief the newly elected President Carter. In the documents, there is talk of UFOs and alien corpses recovered, and in particular, the first contacts between the US government and extraterrestrials from the 50s, and of close contacts in 1964, which are still going on. It also talks of attempts at flying UFOs that have been recovered. In 1988, Falcon, along with another secret agent, Condor, appeared incognito on television and confirmed the facts. Moore was able to vouch for the credentials of the two agents and was able to vouch for everything that had been said by the other nine secret agents. Therefore, according to these sources in particular, official contact with the extraterrestrials exists. We are now showing an interview with an aeronautical engineer who says that he has worked for years at a secret base on UFO flight simulators in contact with aliens. What did you see on the base? Saw aliens, yes. Dead or alive? Alive. What were they doing? What did they want from us? The aliens are there, they're just, it's a transfer of technology, basically. Uh, there's a trade uh, of, of, uh, of information and a trade of material things. I'll just give you one element that we give them. We give them boron. Mm. They, they, we, we give them boron. A certain, you know, uh, uh, mind process boron. And there's other things that they, they also uh, trade. In addition to understanding the humans more, you know. That, mm -hmm. There is some trade on the human part of it, but I don't know what that is. I, I was not involved. So is there a relationship between the U.S. government and aliens? There is a relation to, uh, you call it the U.S., and you have to understand there's, and maybe, I don't know if I've explained it uh, before, but I think I have. Uh, you have the U.S. government. The inter inter U.S. government is only an interface. Mm -hmm. They really don't know what's going on totally. Uh, it's, it's, uh, as far as I I understand it, there's only an interface with the CIA, but it's, it's, I call it a satellite government. Are the aliens prisoners? Uh, the aliens were not uh, ever held as a prisoner. Uh, they could have left any time. What, what originally happened was they had four that was... Uh, uh, apparently uh, accepted the fact that, you know, we're here, we're going to uh, do something with, you know, the humans. And they were taken to New Mexico, to a facility in New Mexico, where they spent nine months. This is from a, a saucer landing, or you could call it a saucer crash, that happened in uh, outside of Kingman, New uh, Arizona. Uh, that was in uh, about May of 1953. They're in several different places. In the States and elsewhere. No, I, I just don't. Uh, I understand there's a place in Australia uh, where they have, uh, have a certain number of them. Uh, but, you know, how many, for example, England and, and so forth and so on, Puerto Rico, I, I just wouldn't know. I, in the skies above Area 51 in Nevada, numerous objects similar to UFOs have been spotted. Are they piloted by Americans? Assemble there. Yes. Assemble there. You know, they, they might build, fabricate some parts, but mostly the parts are fabricated elsewhere and, and shipped into there, flown in, you know. There in the background is Area 51, the most mysterious base in the USA. A long, dusty road, and then hidden behind the mountains, the base. According to engineer Hugh House, there is close collaboration with extraterrestrials, described by him as humanoids of oriental type with dark skins. 
and some UFOs are piloted by Americans. Talk about science fiction. But Hugh House is not the only person to believe all this. John Lear, a famous American test pilot, active in CIA operations, holds similar ideas. As do others, like Virgil Armstrong, ex-CIA agent. As like engineer Benevitz, who maintains that an extraterrestrial base exists at Puche, New Mexico. We are approaching the perimeter of the base. Look at the notices. To go beyond them signifies danger. A van is watching us. Sensors everywhere, surveillance cameras and microphones. On the hill, an observation tower. This is the secret base seen from a Soviet satellite. A very long runway crosses a salt lake which hides an enormous underground construction, invisible even to satellites. And these are the photos taken of that base from the neighboring mountains some years ago. Today it'd be impossible to do it. The stealth bomber, the invisible aircraft, was tested at Area 51, as was the Aurora prototype. They seemed to have used alien technology. But also taking off from the base would be UFOs in the classic flying saucer shape. An eyewitness of this is Bob Lazar, an engineer of some time at the base, where his job was to study the propulsion system, a scientific engine. The technology used is anti-gravitational and electromagnetic. These are the plans of the saucer studied by Bob Lazar. It was George Knapp, a famous reporter and researcher from Las Vegas, who discovered Lazar a few years ago. Is it a credible story? Uh, since I've been researching this topic, I've found more than two dozen other people who've worked at this base in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s uh, who have given bits and pieces of the same story, all telling me that they've seen these disc-shaped craft out there, some who suggest that they've seen indications that it's of alien origin. Uh, they admit that we've probably built our own discs, but that some of these things came from somewhere else. I, I believe the story. Before leaving the area, an obligatory visit to a nearby hostelry, well known to ufologists, the Alien Inn. Thousands of curious people have come here in search of extraordinary sightings. A tourist tells us. Two weeks ago, I was coming home from Las Vegas. I was coming down in the other valley and south of the black mailbox, about four miles, I seen an object, a flying saucer. It was shaped like a cigar, only flatter. If you know what a hay truck is, it was about two, two hay trucks long and probably a hay truck and a half high. Uh, it was three to four miles away and it had lights all over it. It was the color of a dull gray. It was 9.42 in the evening and there was two guard trucks came to us and they tried to get us to give us our names and addresses and telephone numbers and we all refused and drove off and it was there from I'd say it was in view for at least five minutes and it was jumping up and down like it was having a hard time taking off and it did this maybe two to three times bouncing up and down and then all of a sudden it just went Shh, and it was gone. What about the space missions? Were UFOs never seen? Or other forms of life observed? We show you other documents, which are surprising to say the least. In 1969, Apollo 11 made the first landing on the moon. Let's listen. Uh, what is it? Who has some explanation for that? We have none. Don't worry. Continue your program. Oh, boy, it's, uh... Uh, God, what is that there? 
And these are extraordinary photos of UFOs taken by US missions on the moon. The UFOs seem to be observing. A UFO lit up to the left, high up. A UFO in the foreground, like those photographed on the ground at Gulf Breeze in the USA. And strange artificial traces on the moon, so there is life. This is a radio recording of the shuttle, decoded and transmitted in clear by mistake. We are retransmitting the space shuttle air to communications for mission 20. This is WA-3 NAN. Uh, Eastern, uh, this is Discovery. We still have the alien spacecraft uh, under appearance. Behind the shuttle, a strange light. A mysterious object flashes by and leaves the Earth's atmosphere at extraordinary speed. A UFO or secret weapon from Star Wars. And again, other strange and very rapid objects seen from the shuttle. They're not drops of water or ice which have detached themselves from the shuttle. And these strange objects, which seem like microorganisms, are in fact enormous. Cooper, an American astronaut, is, like all his colleagues, bound to secrecy. He has, however, declared in writing that he saw a UFO coming down at an American military base. For Cooper, it was certainly of extraterrestrial origin. But the Soviet astronaut, Kaevinal, speaks in an observation he made during a space mission. <laughs> It's an object, perhaps, of organic matter. Talk about mysterious. But there's more. Numerous U.S. and Soviet expeditions have explored the red planet, Mars. Its rugged surface makes one think of river erosion on a gigantic scale. According to the US expert, Richard Hoagland, NASA has taken numerous extraordinary photos, but has never published them. Photos of enormous face and of three pyramids. Is this evidence of the past? Drawing a line between them, according to Hoagland, 
a triangle identical to the one in Egypt, which links the Sphinx and the neighboring pyramids. Were they therefore built by the same hand? But couldn't these photos be the result of computer enhancement? No, for many specialists, they are genuine. It should be noted that all the subsequent expeditions to Mars ended in disaster. The Soviet probe Phobos, called after the moon of Mars, which seems to have a strangely empty interior, transmitted to Earth these images of a strange cigar before unexpectedly going silent forever. Was it hit or destroyed? These are the other images taken on Mars. Evidence of past life? And these lines are so precise. How can one fail to think of those at Nazca in Peru, which we're seeing now? But why the secrecy up until now? At the beginning of 1947, it was certainly to avoid repetition of what happened in 1938, when Orson Welles, during a radio play, announced, the Martians have landed. Thousands of terrified people fled the cities. Then another motive. It couldn't be admitted that UFOs could violate every defense system. In addition, there was a very strong military interest in extracting from this a technical advantage, whether for the US and our allies or for the Soviet Union. But there was recognition of the problem. The UN Secretary, Yu Thant, said to the New York Post in 1967 that the most urgent question after Vietnam was that of UFOs. There were UN initiatives. A commission specifically on the UFO question was blocked by the US in 1978. Also, an important initiative to send signals into space and to capture any incoming signals, the SETI project, had a very brief life because of the withdrawal of public funds. The project continued on a private basis and it seems that something is coming out of it, the Phoenix project. SETI has also published very important studies on the effect of an encounter with other civilizations. They want to avoid a repetition of what happened to the peoples of South America at the time of the Spanish conquest. Plans of action have already been studied in detail to proceed in a rational manner and to prevent dangerous political, social, cultural and religious backlashes. American public opinion has several times asked the White House to tell the truth about UFOs. It should be noted that 53% of Americans believe in the extraterrestrial origins of UFOs, and 29% are certain that there have been contacts between extraterrestrials and the government. For some time, the old hands have been taking the initiative. Among them, the ex-Sergeant Major from NATO, Robert Dean, and the astronaut, Robert Cooper. They ask that the military evidence, and not just the American, should be released from secrecy. Coordinator of the International Initiative at the highest levels is Dr. Stephen Greer. Why then the secrecy today after almost 50 years? I think that the issue surrounds the secrecy now around the fact that, number one, it's been institutionalized. Mm -hmm. Number two, they've spent 50 years denying the obvious. Number three, 
and this is very key, is that the technology, the machinery of these extraterrestrial spacecraft is so advanced that the private groups that are doing the research on this, the private corporations, what's been called the military-industrial complex, mm -hmm. has a vested interest in maintaining control over that. Why? Well, it's control. It's, it's financial. Uh, it's energy systems, yes. et cetera. You're talking about <clears throat> technology which would make obsolete the electricity plants that we have now. Uh, burning of oil would not be necessary. Gas would not be necessary. Electric generating power plants would be obsolete. So there is a, okay, I mean, this is the technology we're talking about is utilizing uh, the extraterrestrial technology. They're not using oil and they're not using nuclear power. They're using zero point energy or free energy systems that are very advanced and fully operational. So the groups that are controlling this are doing it now not so much out of a concern about the Cold War. The Cold War is over. They're doing it more out of a concern for controlling and keeping control of the technology. If only man could in this way have at his disposal the necessary technologies to protect the Blue Planet from ecological catastrophe and guarantee its future. Certainly the new technologies would provoke an economic, political, social and cultural revolution which would be necessary to control. And contact with extraterrestrial civilizations will perhaps improve us and make us more humble. Perhaps we're at the dawn of a new adventure for humanity, a new challenge to freedom, responsibility and tolerance. <laughs>